All right. What do you think? Yep. All right, let's do it. Um, okay. Welcome everyone to this week's uh, virtual AMO seminar. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker for today, Professor Kader Merch from the University of from Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, Kader received his bachelor's in physics from Reed College, after which he spent a year as a beekeeper before beginning his PhD um, work at UC Berkeley in the Stamper Kern Group. Um, after his PhD, Kader remained at Berkeley for a postdoc working on superconducting quantum circuits in the group of Professor Irfan Siddiqui. Kader has made um, numerous important contributions to our understanding of quantum measurement and quantum noise, and has also won lots of awards for these, including a Sloan Fellowship and a Cottrell Scholar Award. Um, he'll be telling us today about topological control of quantum states through the non-Hermitian dynamics of a superconducting qubit. All you, Kader. Excellent. Thanks for the introduction and the invitation. <clears throat> um, I'm super excited to tell you about the research we've been doing. So let me start, uh, just to give you some context, I'm going to start with sort of a broad, maybe narrow overview of open quantum systems and quantum measurement. No pause for questions after that sort of appetizer to the talk. So first, I'll start by saying that you know, dissipation and decoherence are quintessential aspects of quantum optics. That is, if you have an atom by itself, we'll find this a closed system and it undergoes unitary evolution described by the Schrodinger equation, but there's no optics. And so in order to have light, we have to consider um, instead an open system so that this atom radiatively interacts with this environment. And this interaction leads to uh, two things. One, it imbues the atom with a lifetime. So there's a lifetime of this excited state, um, but it also gives the system a line with gamma. And so typically when we have this open quantum system, we have to then adopt a master equation treatment to describe the system in terms of a density operator rho. And that's because, so for example, if the atom starts off in the excited state, and sometimes later maybe in the ground state, the the master equation treatment really reflects our lack of knowledge about the state in between. So the system exists in some sort of mixed state, either in the ground state or the excited state. Well, that might be troubling to some and that we don't know what the state is, the state is somehow indefinite. And so the picture of a quantum jump was invented to kind of save the wave function um, description of the state. So the idea of a quantum jump is that the atom it you know, starts off in its excited state, and then at some point it undergoes an abrupt jump to the ground state. And then maybe it decays at a different time. And so the density matrix really reflects our lack of knowledge about when these quantum jumps are occurring. And these quantum jumps imply a sort of specific type of detection. That is when you talk about quantum jumps, you imagine your atom radiatively emitting photons into the environment and that there's some sort of hypothetical photon detector that might go click when the atom, when the photon is detected. And so the story goes, the atom's in the excited state, the detector's silent, detector's silent, the atom's still in the excited state, and so forth and so on, until the detector goes click. At which point we know that the atom has made an abrupt transition from its excited state to its ground state, and that's a quantum jump. And then of course the atom is now in the ground state. So this tells us the sort of quantum trajectory that this atom took from its excited state to its ground state. The point I wanna highlight here is that there's a relationship between the state of the atom and the signal that's detected, that the signal sort of tells you when this quantum jump occurs. So one of the first projects I worked on when I started my group at Washington University some seven years ago was the following question. What if we measure the emission from this atom in a different way. So as you may know, a photon detector is measuring the, the electromagnetic field and the photon number basis, for example. Um, but we can measure the electromagnetic field in multiple ways. And one of those might be to make a homodyne measurement to measure in the coherent state basis, for example. So a homodyne detector works by interfering this sort of fluorescence with a local oscillator and seeing if the interference is either in phase or outer phase with that local oscillator signal. And so we set up an exa uh, this experiment 
And when we uh, took our first measurement, this is what we saw. Okay, so this is the signal of an atom decaying via radiative emission into the environment detected with a home metal detector. And what do we see? It's a bunch of noise. Maybe not so surprising. We're expecting one photon of energy deposited over some radiative emission lifetime uh, into the environment that is just vacuum fluctuations. And so really what we're seeing is just the quantum noise associated with the electromagnetic vacuum of that particular mode of the electromagnetic field. The signal is really different than the click that we would have gotten from a photo detector. So to understand the relationship between the state and the signal, well, we have to open up a book on sort of quantum measurement and quantum, the matter light interaction. And so the basic idea is we can take the signal and each detection of the signal, we can associate with a certain type of measurement operator. And we can use those measurement operators in the theory of positive operator value measures to determine a piecewise continuous trajectory for the density operator rho. And then we can calculate from that, say block components like expectation value of sigma x or the expectation value of sigma y or the expectation value of sigma z to describe the evolution of this atom in its state space on the block sphere. And the essence of what's going on is that, well, the signal comes from an interaction like sigma minus a dagger, right? The atom becomes de excited and a photon is put into the environment. And so the detection is really, we're detecting something related to the real part of sigma minus. And as you may know, the real part of sigma minus is just sigma x. And so our measurement is somewhat proportional to sigma x, but of course there's the quantum noise associated with the vacuum of the electromagnetic vacuum. Okay, so what do these trajectories look like? What does the quantum dynamics look like? Before we had this idea of, if you put the excited state at the top of this and put the ground state at the bottom, here's my block sphere, it's just a one plane of that. The idea of a quantum jump is you have some sort of abrupt instantaneous jump from the excited state to the ground state. But in this case, the signal is telling us about the expectation value of sigma x. And so the signal starts off going a little negative. And so the trajectory kind of goes to negative sigma x and then becomes positive. So then it kind of comes over here and then it kind of wiggles its way back and forth on the surface of the block sphere, eventually finding its way to the ground state. Of course, in our actual experiment, we don't detect 100% of the signal, so we lose some of the signal. And so we actually have a uh, mixed state representation of things. So then rather than diffusing on the surface of the block sphere as a pure state, we end up with trajectories that diffuse their way through the interior of the block sphere from the excited state to the ground state. Let me emphasize that every time we collect one of these measurement signals, we get a different sample of the quantum noise and measurement signal, and therefore the quantum trajectories are different on every instance. So here's another quantum trajectory and another one over here. Similarly, if we started off start the qubit, for example, in a, a superposition state, so over here where the expectation value of sigma x is equal to one, so the ground plus excited over the square root of two, now we get trajectories that somewhat paradoxically become more excited as they decay. This has to do with the fact that we're just measuring the expectation value of sigma x. So if we can compare these two pictures of radiative emission, we first discussed this idea of quantum jumps that when we have a photon detector, it gives us a certain click. Well, that is associated with a jump from the excited state to the ground state. And if we perform lots of those experiments, uh, we end up, we can sort of average over this ensemble of jumps at different times and we'll recover the familiar exponential decay that's, that describes the ensemble evolution. But now when we're measuring the, using homodyne measurement to measure the quadrant amplitudes of the emitted field, we don't have quantum jumps because we don't have individual detections at random times, but instead we have this noisy signal. And so now we have a diffusive quantum trajectory that describes how the state makes it from the excited state to the ground state. And of course, if I, average over an ensemble of these quantum diffusion trajectories, I again get the exact same exponential decay. So both pictures give you the same ensemble evolution. And that's why we call this different unravelings of the master equation. So in the most common case, this master equation we're describing is called the Lindblad master equation. And it is relevant under certain circumstances where we have a Markovian environment and so forth and so on. 
and just highlight a few pieces of this Lindblad master equation that there's you know, a unitary term, there may be some drive coupling the states of the qubit. And then there's these two terms of the master equation. One is called the jump term, that's right here. And the other one is this co sort of coherent non-unitary term. And when I talk about unraveling the master equation, we're modifying this Lindblad master equation to create a stochastic master equation. We're adding an additional piece that tells us the stochastic update from the signal we're receiving. And depending on the type of measurement we're performing, whether it's photon detection or it's quadrature detection, we'll get have different stochastic updates from the signal leading to very different evolution of the quantum state. So as a sort of warm up appetizer for the talk, um, I tried to tell you about how detecting the environment of an open quantum system, we use that to unravel the master equation into these individual quantum trajectories. And the type of trajectories we get or that type of unraveling depends on the type of measurement that we make. So this is your first chance to, uh, to ask some questions. So I'll pause now for any questions from the moderator. Sounds good. So uh, there's a couple questions. Um, uh, let me start off with uh, a question from John Kunjimin. Um, the question is what's exactly coherent about the coherent non-unitary terms in the Lindblad equation? So what is coherent about it? I will describe this the next thing, but the, what's coherent about it is that if we just look at this term here, we can actually recover an effective Hamiltonian that is the generator of time translation. And we can plug that into a Schrodinger equation. So we can have pure state evolution under that effect of Hamiltonian. Okay. And so um, we no longer need a density matrix under that case. Another question is, uh, is there a many body generalization of this? Um, so if I imagine instead of sort of, you know, it from like a two level system perspective and homodyne detection, if I now have, you know, an interacting set of qubits, can I sort of generalize this kind of technique to a many body system? And what does that give me access to? Yeah, interesting question. So um, there's a couple things I can say about that. Imagine, you know, one thing that's been studied is, let's say we have uh, two of these qubits and one can make a measurement of some sort of joint property of these two qubits. And then therefore you can unravel individual trajectories of the two qubit state. And one can find that the measurement and certain measurement trajectories lead to this two qubits to be entangled. So there's an extension in terms of having more complicated states than just a single um, two level system. And then there's another facet of this is imagine you have two uh, qubits and one of these qubits is sort of the, the thing you're interested in and the other one is the environment. Then we can imagine you know, entangling these two qubits and then making measurements of this environment qubit to infer the quantum dynamics of the first qubit. And so oftentimes that's the most, that's why, why one might introduce the concepts of weak measurements and quantum trajectories is by considering the measurement apparatus itself as another quantum bit. Got it. And then maybe one can extend, imagine some very complicated many body system and making quantum trajectories, making, making measurements of some small component of that and using that to infer something that's going on in its many body system. And that's a really exciting question, which is something we're thinking very hard about. Awesome. How can these quantum trajectories of some part of that many body system infer the dynamics of that larger system? Got it. Um, another sort of a conceptual question from Nathan Shine um, in terms of how to think about the physics here. Is one suggesting that the actual quantum state is different based on the type of measurement or rather that the kind of best estimate of what's going on microscopically is different based on the type of measurement? Yeah. So that gets into almost foundational questions about what the quantum state is. As an experimentalist, I take a practical view of the quantum state. The quantum state is my best guess as the measurer of what the state is. And that's why when we have a density matrix row, density matrix description, I, I make the best, that's my best description of the state. But um, the, the type of detection that you make does alter the state in a certain way. And this gets into this concept of steering that we can choose to, if we have two entangled systems, 
considered like Alice and Bob. Depending on the type of measurements we make on Bob's qubit, we do, there is, we do collapse the entanglement of this two qubit system in a specific way. And so the state of the Alice's qubit is changed by how we measure Bob's qubit. And that's exactly what's going on here. Got it. I, I can't help but asking this question. Uh, Professor Dan Stamper Curran says, hi, Cater. Uh, in your <laughs> continuous record of sigma x, what feature of the data tells me qualitatively that the qubit has decayed at this specific time? It's related to a couple other questions that have been asked. What feature of the data tells me the qubit has decayed at a specific time? It's, so I guess let's look at one of these uh, pictures here to get a sense of this. The, de the decay doesn't occur at a specific time the way it does when we're measuring the quantum jumps with photon detection. What we have instead is uh, there's a, so the, if you think about the Lindblad piece, there's that coherent unitary piece, which is just sort of constantly bringing the state down from the top of the block sphere toward the bottom. And so at any given time, the state must exist on a surface that's ever collapsing toward the bottom of the thing. The stochastic update allows it to push from this side to that side, for example, the block sphere but the decay is sort of constantly moving down and that's enforced by that coherent non-unitary piece of the Lindblad master equation. Okay, and maybe maybe one last question and there's, there's quite, quite a few, but we'll have to move on. Uh, Miroslav Urbanek asks, um, can one think of quantum jumps as just quantum trajectories measured over longer time scales, or what is the difference between a quantum jump and a quantum trajectory? So my, opinion is that the quantum jump is the trajectory. It is how the state is evolving in time. Um, and that this picture of an instantaneous uh, jump is appropriate when one has a detector that measures infinitely fast in time and gives a click of the photon. Now, the question of what's going on inside this quantum jump is very interesting. And there's a phenomenal paper by Zlatko Minev from last year, two years ago, where they break down the details of how one measures clicking of the, this sort of photon detection. And they're able to sort of slow that process down and show that this, what's going on inside this quantum jump is actually a very interesting sort of rather coherent process. And so there are ways to dig into that specific quantum jump and learn more about exactly what those trajectories look like. And I'll touch on some of those aspects later in this talk. Sounds like a, a good place to continue. Excellent. I love all the good questions. Okay, so I last left you at the Lindblad master equation. And uh, one of the questions was quite astute, sort of asking about this coherent non-unitary piece. And um, that brings the question of what did I mean by that? And what I mean is that imagine one could somehow eliminate this jump term Okay, if you eliminate the jump term, then we can actually write down an effective Hamiltonian for the system. This is the time gener the generator of time translation. Um, so we no longer need a lap master equation. But the price that we pay is that this effective Hamiltonian is non-Hermitian. That is, this piece is Hermitian, this is Hermitian by construction, but this I here makes this a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. So, Point being, uh, the evolution of a decaying system or some sort of uh, quantum system with the quantum jump term removed could be described by a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. And so maybe you're thinking, well, wait a minute. I've taught quantum mechanics or I'm taking quantum mechanics or I've read all these books. They always say that you know, a Hamiltonian is typically described, uh, assumed to be described by a Hermitian operator. And that's convenient because if we have a Hermitian operator, we're guaranteed to have real eigenvalues, which guarantees us unitary time evolution. You're gonna have a complete set of orthogonal eigenvectors, very convenient mathematically. And so all these books generally assume that one has a Hermitian Hamiltonian. And in fact, they take pains to make example problems of what goes wrong when you don't have a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. All of a sudden, probability is not conserved. Things get really strange. Well. It may not be, so if we take sort of unitary time evolution as the critical thing that we're after, 
Um, Carl Bender pointed out in 1998 that in fact, you can have unitary time evolution with a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, uh, given that the system has PT or parity time symmetry. Okay, so Carl's a mathematical physicist. He can write down whatever weird Hamiltonian he wants. He doesn't live in an experimental laboratory. He lives in an office. And so he wrote down this Hamiltonian. It's like a harmonic potential, but it's got this weird complex term on the potential. And what Carl uh, Bender and Stefan Betcher discovered is that, hey, this Hamiltonian turns out to have, in some cases, real eigenvalues. That's interesting. And Carl's paper, paper really launched a, um, a deluge of theoretical physics studying sort of the fundamental physics of PT symmetric quantum mechanics, that really PT symmetry would be the fundamental symmetry that's important to have in quantum mechanics. Now, as a historical note, uh, Carl wasn't the first to observe this fact. In fact, a mathematician, Emmanuel Cassetti, first observed this back in 1980, but her observations didn't catch on with the physics community. So it was really Carl's uh, paper that inspired this giant growth in theory papers on PT symmetry. Okay, time goes on, and it wasn't actually until 2005 and then in 2008, more significantly, that a few papers uh, pointed out the connection between PT symmetry and gain and loss, something that can be realized fairly easily in optics. And so following these papers, there's been a sort of a huge growth in experimental work in PT symmetric and non-Hermitian quantum mechanics. So the classic example, which comes from Dimitri uh, Christodoulidis at the University of Central Florida is the following. Consider it uh, two optical modes. Let's label them A and B. One of them has gain, so it has some sort of gain medium and you're pumping it. And one has loss, well, that's easy to achieve. And then we can uh, see that this has PT symmetry. Well, if we apply the parity operator, that exchanges A and B. And if we apply time reversal, we uh, turn gain into loss and loss into gain. And so we're back to the same system as before. Mode B has loss and mode A has gain. So this has this PT symmetry. And so I mentioned there's been a lot of experimental work studying this thing. There are even uh, AMO-ish experiments studying systems that have effective PT symmetry. So I'll just show you two examples here. One is that in um, optically trapped lithium atoms, so we have two uh, states of lithium atoms and there's some sort of drive that couples one of those spin states uh, to an excited state that gets blasted out of the tra trap. And so there's some coupling between the two systems and it, this, uh, exhibits all of the hallmark, hallmark features of these parity time symmetric systems, which I'll go through some of those. Another example is in optomechanics. So Jack Harris's group studies these nanomechanical membranes where there's different modes of these membranes and the modes can be uh, driven to have gain or loss. And so he studies the, the, the physics of effective PT symmetry in these uh, modes of the nanomechanical membranes. Now, the reason why uh, there are many physical systems that uh, can realize the sort of physics of PT symmetry and non-Hermitian dynamics uh, stems from sort of a common differential equation we encounter in math, but also in physics. And so uh, you might be familiar with the differential equation where you have uh, the time derivative of some n vector A um, is equal to minus I times some n by n matrix B times that same old n vector A. And you may recall that if B is Hermitian and constant, then we'll have eigenvectors of this, of this matrix B, and we'll have eigenvalues. And the resulting dynamics of any initial uh, state are trivial. That is, we look at the overlap of the initial state with the eigenvectors of this matrix, and each one of those has the trivial time, de di time dependence given by the eigenvalues. Now, one place this such a um, differential equation occurs is in classical mechanics. So imagine uh, that we have a system of oscillators coupled with springs. Um, well, here the, this uh, n vector would be the state vector that encodes the position for maybe the momenta of those oscillators. And the system will have nor normal modes and normal more fre mode frequencies. And we end up with the same trivial dynamics we had in the mathematics case. And so the idea is that these two things, they're not exactly the same, but they're related by an isomorphism or the classical mechanical system is isomorphic to the math system. Okay, we also encounter this in quantum mechanics. So 
consider a system of uh, n quantum levels. Well, here this A is now a state vector psi, and this matrix B is a Hamiltonian. We'll have eigenstates and eigenvalues. And again, the dynamics are the same trivial uh, dynamics that one does in sort of any introductory quantum mechanics problem. Okay, so since we started math, well, math, you don't have to uh, be constrained to having Hermitian constant matrices B, but in fact, you could allow any complex matrix B, so it could be non-Hermitian, for example. And uh, in order to realize a non-Hermitian uh, dynamical matrix for a classical mechanical system, one might have to add gain and loss to the system. And that, that can be say, uh, achieved by adding sort of damping and gyrators to these different modes. Okay, how about in the quantum case? Well, what we have to look for is the dynamics of a quantum system without this quantum jump term, as I started with. So how do we do this? Well, imagine we have come back to our radiating atom. It's emitting photons and imagine it in free space, it can emit photons into all four pi steradians of free space. So if we wanna isolate the no jump evolution, well, we'd have to surround this atom with detectors, detect all the solid angle of the atom and then condition on the no click evolution, just make sure that it doesn't decay. Well, that sounds technically quite challenging. And technically challenging ideas are the, the creative food of experimentalists. And so given that challenge, we thought of, okay, well, is there an easier way to do this? And so what we came up with the following. We're gonna extend the Hilbert space of this atom one more level here. And we'll look at the sort of quantum dynamics of this qubit, which forms the upper level of states of this three level system. And then what we have to do is just condition the fact that this qubit remains intact, that it doesn't decay out of this manifold of states into this ground state. It's like an effective continuum for this qubit. So this is an experimental talk. Um, and so we do this, we do experiments in the lab and we do these experiments with something called the transmon circuit. So it's a superconducting um, quantum bit formed by patterning sil uh, silicon chips with aluminum. We take a capacitor, we shunt it with two Josephson junctions and a squid geometry, cool it down. And what we end up with is a potential energy landscape with uh, some number, maybe up to five energy eigenstates of this effective potential. So this chip, which is a superconducting qubit, gets embedded in a three-dimensional cavity. That's this box here. And then we couple this cavity to an external environment where we've taken some pains to use bath engineering techniques to shape the density of states in this external environment, such that the fluctuations are peaked at some frequencies and suppressed at others. So what it gives us is as we tune the frequency of this, this qubit, so we shift the flux through the circuit, the decay rates of the different energy levels vary dramatically. And so we twist knobs and adjust currents until we get to a situation where we have the following hierarchy of decay rates. So the stable ground state, the excited state decays relatively rapidly to the ground state with a decay rate of eight per microsecond. And this upper level F decays relatively slowly to the excited state, 0.2 in comparison. So we can kind of ignore this decay rate here. Okay, so to give you a sort of picture of how the experiments are gonna take place, we'll prepare our qubit. That is, we start in the ground state, we excite it up into this upper manifold, maybe we excite it up into the F state. And then we're gonna allow it to evolve under this effective non hermitian Hamiltonian so that evolution is gonna involve some coupling between these two energy levels and maybe we're dri driving Rabi oscillations between the two. And then we're gonna post-select the system in the qubit manifold. That is, we'll make a high fidelity single shot readout of the qubit. So we might find that it's in the excited state, fine. We might find that it's in the, this F state, the second excited state, that's reasonable. But if we find that the qubit is decayed to the ground state, we throw the results away because this means that a jump has occurred. So we're enabling this Hamiltonian by post-selecting just on the no jump evolution. Okay, so getting into the full complexity of the experiment, we're actually gonna have two knobs that we can control experimentally. 
So one, so we have this upper level of states and we're gonna drive, connect the two states with a microwave drive. That creates a Hamiltonian J sigma X. So it's gonna create Abrabi oscillations between the states. And that drive will be detuned from the excited state by some amount delta. And so that gives rise to this effective Hamiltonian um, delta minus I gamma over two. We have this Hamiltonian term J connecting the two states. So it's a non Hermitian Hamiltonian given that we have an I on the uh, diagonal. Okay, so two by two Hamiltonian, that's not too hard. It's a simple exercise to go through and now calculate the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this effective Hamiltonian. And so we do that and here's what we get. So the eigenvalues now are complex. So it's this nasty expression involving I's down in the square roots, pretty hard to simplify. And the eigenvectors can then be expressed fairly simply in terms of the eigenvalues. To give you a sense of what's going on, I can plot the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of this uh, effective Hamiltonian here on the block sphere and in the sort of energy space. And the point is that the eigenvalues are complex, so we don't, the, the energy doesn't exa only exist on the real axis. We have some sort of arbitrary values here. And the eigenvectors themselves are going to maybe be along here, and they're not necessarily orthogonal any longer. Okay, let's actually look at the energy landscape of the system. And in this case, we have to look at uh, the Riemann manifold that describe the complex energies of the system. So the tuning parameters that we have now, they're sort of experimental knobs, are parameter J, which is a sort of coupling rate between the two, which is just given by the amplitude of a drive and the detuning delta. And here's the imaginary part of the eigenvalues and here's the real part of the eigenvalues. So there's two eigenvalues. There are places where the eigenvalues are purely imaginary right here. There are places where the eigenvalue difference is actually purely real over here. And there's a degeneracy in the system, right? Where these uh, sheets meet. Okay, this is not any ordinary de degeneracy. That is, uh, we normally think of for a, Herm a Hermitian Hamiltonian, a degeneracy uh, is a case where the eigenvalues are degenerate, yet because it's Hermitian, we're still guaranteed to have orthogonal eigenvectors. Such a degeneracy is often called a diabolic point. In this case, we have a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, and so the de degeneracy is called an exceptional point. And this is a case where the eigenvalues are degenerate and the eigenvectors are degenerate. And that can be seen by just looking at my eigenvectors of this Hamiltonian, you see the eigenvalues live at the top of this thing here. And so if those are degenerate, we're gonna have only one eigenvector of the Hamiltonian. Another way to put that is the Hamiltonian is no longer diagonalizable at the exceptional point. So that's a brief overview of how we create an effective non-Hermitian system by post-selecting on the no jump evolution. Uh, this is a situation where the Eigen energies are complex and the generacies are called exceptional points. So again, I'll open up the floor uh, to questions before I start telling you about the physics we see in this uh, system. Awesome. Um, so we have a question here, which is, uh, it seems like gamma serves as a double-edged sword. You both need it to be able to give the non-Hermitian evolution, but it also limits how long you can watch the dynamics for. Does gamma fundamentally mm -hmm. limit whether or not you can evolve under a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian to late times to see asymptotically long time dynamics? Yeah, excellent uh, question. And of course, and that's very well uh, articulated. And indeed, gamma limits how long we can make the measurements for, um, because we do need, we, we, as we um, let the system evolve, our post-selection success becomes exponentially small. But it's not as bad as you might think because uh, there are certain cases where the decay rate can actually be quite small. There's a place up here where the imaginary part of the eigen energy is in fact zero. So that's a stable state that doesn't end up having much decay. So there are places that hurt more than others and certain experiments that are harder than others given that we have this um, painful time scale, one over gamma that we're up against. But the advantage that we have in circuit QED is that 
we can do experiments at a rate of say 10 to the seven per second. Is that an exaggeration? No, it's a little weird. Maybe it's, let's say, 10 to the 6 per second. But these rates, okay, go back one more. 10 to the 5 per second. And we're patient and so forth. So we can do a large number of experiments. And so we routinely take experiments out to time scales that are on order 10 over gamma or more. And so that allows us to access, in my mind, things that are pretty much long time scale dynamics. But there are some, some things we can't do. Uh, with this due to that time scale. Thanks. Um, a quick clarification question. What does IME, what did IME represent in the transmon uh, experiment? A couple of us were wondering yeah, this. It's a it's a um it's an impedance mismatch element. Somewhat embarrassingly, we had various uh, we, our, our goal was to shape the density of states of that electromagnetic field outside of the, the cavity to enhance decay at a certain frequency. And my students just played around with different sort of impedances one could put there. And so it was just a cavity with a wire stuck through the center. So something with a very uh, low or very high impedance. So impedance mismatch element. Got it. Um, actually, there were a couple folks that also had very related questions about this. Um, we were, people were wondering what aspects of this kind of physics are sort of uniquely quantum or where does quantum mechanics exactly play a role? It seems like in coupled classical oscillator systems, one also has, for example, bifurcations or even in sort of, you know, lo the logistic map, one can have bifurcations of trajectories, which seem to also satisfy this exceptional definition. Yeah. And so I think this is, this is the, the quintessential question of the field of quantum non Hermitian dynamics. So one answer is um, we see the same thing and expect to see a lot of the same physics in these different systems because they're all, uh, there's an isomorphism that connects the different pieces together. Um, on the other hand, when we talk about these quantum states here, there is no classical analog of these energy eigenstates in this quant these quantum systems. So it's truly quantum with no classical uh, analog, but we do expect to see a lot of the same, same effects uh, that we'll see in classical cases. Um, maybe through my talk, I'll be able to show some features that I think could almost be considered uniquely quantum. But again, it's always hard to really pin something on being uniquely uh, quantum, perhaps unless it involves some really uh, sophisticated entanglement, which we haven't really seen yet. But I'll talk about how uh, we acquire uh, sort of geometric phases on quantum states, their dynamics. That feels very quantum to me, but I imagine there are also classical analogs to those. Okay, perfect. I think uh, I'll have to probably cut off this. We'll have the time for more questions at the end, but let's, um, let's let Cater continue for a bit. All right. So, now I want to take you into the, the, the most intriguing features of the system that we've been studying now for the last three years. So we have um, two tunable parameters in our system. And those are this, uh, the detuning delta and the coupling rate J. And there's an exceptional point that occurs when J is equal to gamma over four. Um, there's actually two exceptional points in this drawing because the J can also be negative. So when J is equal to plus or minus gamma over four. Now the experiment or the thought experiment I wanna start with is the following. Let's say we uh, start with our system in this some specific parameter space here, J greater than the exceptional point value. Um, and we'll initialize the system in an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. And then we'll adiabatically tune the system parameters in such a way that we bring the system around the exceptional point. So we think about going slowly, so it's quasi-statically changing the parameter system. We expect that as long as we go slow enough, the system will follow the instantaneous eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. And then we come back to where we started. 
Okay, well, what do we expect to happen? Well, if this is a Hermitian system, that is, there's no exceptional points, there's just a diabolic point degeneracy here at the origin, well, we'd expect to acquire a berry phase and the berry phase of pi from this adiabatic encircling this diabolic point degeneracy. And so what that would do is take some initial state psi and it would map it to psi minus. We get a minus sign on the wave function after going around the degeneracy. Uh, but the system is not Hermitian. And in this case, uh, what happens, or what's expected to happen is quite different. And this is something that may not be first worked out, but I read about it in this paper by Heiss in uh, 1999. Of course, I didn't read it in 1999. I was still in high school at the time. But this is where this is calculated. And the idea is the following. It's going to matter whether or not we go around this exceptional point clockwise. That would be this way. Or counterclockwise. So if we go counterclockwise, and we start off with an initial eigenstate, say, psi minus, well, that state maps to psi plus after one time around the exceptional point. And if we go around again, we get back to minus psi minus. So we have to go twice around the exceptional point to have the same behavior one gets from going around the Hermitian diabolic point degeneracy. But even more strange is if we go clockwise, something different happens. So in this case, psi minus goes to psi plus, minus psi plus. So we get that minus sign the first time around, and then psi plus goes to psi minus. So two things are happening. One is it takes twice around the exceptional point to get back to the same initial state. Um, and two, depending on which way you go, the intermediate state where we switch one state eigenstate to the other picks up a minus sign or not. Okay, Carl Bender, who's a colleague of mine at Washington University, maybe five years ago was in my lab visiting and we're talking about ideas to do these experiments. And he explained this on the board, just sort of wrote this down. It seemed so ridiculous to me. And it took me really until the summer to understand what was going on. Okay, so one way to see what, think about what's going on is to revisit these Riemann manifolds that describe the energy surfaces of this system. So we're gonna start off in one of the eigenstates of the system, the state psi minus uh, for this parameter position here, and then imagine slowly tuning the parameters of the system that we, so that we encircle the exceptional point. And so we're going down here and we reach this branch cut and what's gonna happen is the state will continue on to the lower sheet until we've gone in a full loop in the parameter space like that. So you can see just by the, the shape or the topology of the energy surfaces, we're gonna map the initial state psi minus into a different state psi plus. So you, it's kind of like a landau zener transition, except for you don't come back to where you started in a landau zener transition, you go from parameter one to parameter two, and you go from one eigenstate to the next. But in this case, the parameters are back where we started. Okay. So this is what you might call a state mapping behavior. We take one state and we map it to the other, even though the parameters are back to where they started. Okay. So this is something that's been seen in classical systems uh, to, to large extent. Is this something that we can do in our quantum experiment? Can we see this uh, in all its glory? Well, let's give it a try. So what we do is we prepare this initial eigenstate and we tune these parameters and we tune them over a time scale of zero to 1.5 microseconds. That is, we take one and a half microseconds to do it. And we're gonna pause this evolution as we go around and we can then measure what is the state of the qubit. So we can project onto the different axes of the block sphere to get the expectation values. And so the, the results are shown here. And what we see is that um, we start off in a state here where the expectation value of sigma x is equal to minus one. That's the state psi minus is like that state. And then we make a transition to a place where the expectation value is plus one. So the final state is different than the initial state. The expectation of sigma y stays relatively flat. The expectation of sigma z kind of goes down and comes up. Now we can tell we've done a pretty good job by comparing these curves to the instantaneous eigenstates of the Hamiltonian for this parameter sweep. And so to the extent that the solid curves match the dashed curves, we've done a good job adiabatically tuning the parameters so that we follow the instantaneous eigenstates. We do an okay job. That is, there are some wiggles in here. And so this is due to some 
sort of going faster than is truly adiabatic dynamics creates a superposition of the two eigenstates. And so we see oscillations at the energy difference there. But for the large part, we follow the instantaneous eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Okay, so the point was that the initial state and the final state have different expectation values of sigma x. And so we feel somewhat confident that we see this state mapping behavior. Now, if you want to be really picky, of course, it's in a mixed state to start with because we didn't do a great job preparing the state. And it's a mixed state to end with, but all the same, we have this, uh, we can think about it in terms of its, its density matrix. Okay, so we demonstrated this sort of quantum state transport around the degeneracy. That is, we've shown that if we do this tuning, we start in one state and we tune to this other state, psi minus. And now the question is, is there a way to measure this geometric phase that's accumulated from that state transport? So that's been the focus of a long uh, efforts in the experiment to create an if interference experiment to measure that geometric phase. And the way we do this is, of course, we employ yet another level of our uh, transmon circuit, a level we've labeled the H state, um, as a quantum phase reference for this system. So the idea is we're gonna have interference. Well, one path is this H phase reference system path. In the other path, we'll prepare the state psi minus, we'll apply this time uh, control of the parameters, tuning around the exceptional point, um, all the while it's decaying down to the ground state, we throw those results away. At the end of this tuning, we have a final state that's some mixture of the psi plus eigenstate and psi minus eigenstate. And the cool thing is we can choose by choosing the phase of this final rotation, we can choose which state we want to interfere with the H state. And so then we rotate that into the H, F state and then the final interference occurs with this rotation between the H and F states. And so as we tune that phase, we expect to see um, the probability that, this, that there's something ends up in say the F state uh, will have some sort of sinusoidal dependence. And from that, we can pick off the contrast of interference and also an overall phase difference of those two paths. So there's a lot of possibilities of things to look at here. We've got two directions we can go. We could encircle clockwise or we can sort of counterclockwise. And then we could look at final states, um, psi minus or psi plus. So there's really four different geometric phases we might be interested in looking at. And so each one of those will label you know, chi clockwise for the final state minus and so forth. Okay, so here's the first of those results. We're looking at um, the case where we started off in the state psi minus, we apply clockwise or counterclockwise tunings of the parameters. We end up in the state, final state psi minus, and we're curious what the geometric phase is that's been accumulated. Now, to remind you, we expect based on the shape of the Riemann manifolds that really this is not a process that's favored. That is, we would imagine we, we should go from the state psi minus to psi plus, but that final state is somewhat mixed. And so it's actually possible to measure these phases as well. Okay, what do we see? Uh, we're looking here at the phase as a function of the a tuning parameter J min. That is, we're changing the size of this loop to go sort of lower and lower and lower there, sort of changing the energy scale of the encircling. And what we see in this case is that, you know, in this region here, there's a strong dependence of the phase on the energy scale of the system while we're performing the parameter sweep. And what's going on is the total phase that we measure is a sum of the geometric phase and a dynamical phase. And we're largely seeing the effect of this dynamical phase here because we see a sort of linear dependence of the phase on the energy given by this J min parameter. Fine. Now let's look at the case where we apply this mode switch behavior that is psi minus maps onto psi plus. In this case, we expect the dynamical phase to cancel because the system spends equal time in one eigenstate or the other. And so those phases will cancel out. And so we see a region here where there's really no dependence on the energy scale of the system or the minimum of the sweep where things are fairly constant. But what we do see is that the phase difference depending on clockwise versus counterclockwise uh, encircling parameter loops 
is almost exactly pi. So this is that sort of anticipated uh, chiral generalization of Berry phase that occurs from adiabatic transport around the exceptional point. So that sounds all great. We're very happy about these results. Um, there's of course a lot of details. There's two or three more talks worth of details that I just don't have to talk about, uh, but I should mention them in uh, interest of fairness. So I say adiabatic transport around an exceptional point. And of course, uh, someone pointed out that this uh, gamma sets sort of a time limit on our experiment. We can't go so slow. And so in fact, we're um, not going so slow as to be truly adiabatic. Um, in fact, we're going a bit quicker than that. It, more so, we're making closed loop chain tunings in the parameters. We're coming back to where we started. And so in this case, the dynamics is best described by an effective Floquet Hamiltonian. And so as we change the period of the sweep, sweeping slower and slower and slower, we see a periodicity in the structure of effective exceptional points of this thing. And so the control parameter space is much more rich than uh, just as indicated by the static Riemann surfaces. Uh, point number two is, was also uh, sort of brought up in a question is that the imaginary energy corresponds to loss and this leads to a low success probability. In some cases, we can take enough data to have nice looking uh, maps from between the two states, but in other cases for other paths that um, go through energies that are large and negative and imaginary, we end up with tremendous loss of the state. And that leads to all sorts of um, sort of changes in the, in the, in the outcome success that, is, that, we're, that we're not hoping to see. So it's challenging to do these experiments, but not impossible. Or maybe the success of seeing this uh, expected pi phase difference show up so clearly indicates that maybe we should take this experiment and start to look at even more exotic types of behavior that we can see with these exceptional points. So as kind of an outlook for the talk, let me um, describe what we've done in a little more abstract language and then show how we can extend this to higher order exceptional points in our future work. So I told you about this case of EP2, that is a two-fold degeneracy. And we have a control parameter space uh, given here. One of those controls was J and one was delta, but we don't need to really worry about what they are. And we looked at a case where we have some start and stop point where we go around the exceptional point. Now we could picture this as looking at what's happening to the complex energies um, as a function of time. So the initial state here, I'm showing the, say the real part and the imaginary part of the complex energies. There's two energies there. And as I tune the thing, the system, the energies change and I end up mapping one energy to the other. So I've swapped these two eigen energies by doing this control path. And I can also imagine doing a control path and we've done this experiment where we make a loop that doesn't go around the exceptional point. In this case, the energy is tuned, but we stay in the same state and so we haven't swapped the two eigen values of the Hamiltonian. Okay, well, in this case, you can sort of parameterize that control loop as by the winding number, some sort of integer. Did it go around the exceptional point or not? Did it go around once or twice and so forth? What's really exciting is to think about generalizing this to higher order exceptional points. That is, we have more quantum levels. We're already using them in experiment. We can create a situation where there's a three by three Hamiltonian that has a threefold degeneracy, which we call EP3. And then there are gonna be four control parameters. We've got two coupling rates and we've got two detunings to work with. And so abstractly, there's a region where there should be this fourfold, threefold degeneracy EP3. And there's control parameters, four independent control parameters that take us away from that point. Okay. Well, there's not only a single threefold degeneracy, but there's gonna be a large surface in this control space where there'll be twofold degeneracies, where two of the eigenvalues are degenerate, but the third one is not. So that's the surface of EP2. Now imagine taking a three sphere, so a sphere with a three dimensional surface, a constant distance from this third order exceptional point EP3. That three sphere, intersects the EP2 surface at a single line. And so this three sphere, I can actually do a, a projection of that into a, 
a Cartesian space. So this volume represents the surface of this three sphere. And this line here, this pink line represents where that three sphere intersects the surface of EP2 in that parameter space. And most intriguing, that intersection forms a trefoil knot. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. This thing that Jack Harris uh, has pointed out to me. Now, we can control, consider three different control loops that one might make. One where we uh, don't go around any of these EP2 lines. One where we go around one EP2 line and one where we go through two of these, okay? And those correspond to different ways in that we're exchanging the energy eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. So the black path, the eigenvalues just map to where they were, fine. The red path, what we do is we end up exchanging two of the eigenvalues, but not the third. And then the green path, this one that goes through two lines, that's the case where we've exchanged all three of these eigenvalues, okay? So in this case, the um, control loop is gonna be characterized by the non-abelian generators of the braid group over three elements. And so we're braiding the eigenvalues of this non emission Hamiltonian by tuning these parameters. And so it'll be ex interesting to explore what are the generalizations of the Berry phase that one achieves in these, these control parameters? Can we see this? Can we demonstrate the non-abelian nature of these, these, these braiding operations? And is there something that this uh, physics that's now bordering on the mathematics of topology is uh, useful for? So before I stop to take for questions at the very end, I wanna thank the, um, the students and collaborators that really contributed to this. So first and foremost, uh, Mati Nagalu is um, one of my first PhD students. He did the first experiment I talked about measuring spontaneous emission with um, uh, homodyne detection. And then he started this uh, non emission experiment right before he moved to um, MIT where he's a postdoc. And then the experiment's been taken over by Mary Mabasi, who's now a fourth year student in my group, assisted by a postdoc, Wei Jian Chen. And the whole project got started uh, in collaboration with Yogesh Yogolkar, who's a theorist at IUPUI in Indianapolis. So um, with that, uh, I'll stop for the last uh, question break and take any questions that you have. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. Um, we have lots of questions, so um, I'll try to go through them. Um, there's a question from Mehedi Hassan, which is very much related to, I think this so, sort of a different angle on this higher order exceptional point question. In a situation or a system that has multiple um, exceptional points at different points in parameter space, what happens if one tries to go through a trajectory that encompasses multiple exceptional points? Yeah, so we um, have done experiments where you encircle both exceptional points and indeed the state comes back to where um, it started. The, the, the physics of that state swapping has to do with the fact that there's this branch cut that you're crossing uh, that is right there. It looks kind of like a football. Um, one can also consider uh, loops that are you know, figure eight loops and so forth and so on. And so we've, we've and generally what happens is it can be predicted just by looking at the shapes of the Riemann manifolds. There's, there's really two effects that lead to what one sees. One is the shape of the Riemann manifolds and thinking about what adiabatic evolution leads to. And the other is there are certain paths where one encounters a region of large uh, imaginary eigenvalue where the loss is tremendously bad. If we look here, uh, that's indicated in this region down here, oops, down here. So controls that go through that on that sheet there um, are very hard to do because the system is very lossy. And so any sort of um, imperfection that leads to coupling to the other eigenstate will sort of cause that eigenstate to be amplified by its relative gain and makes those controls difficult to, to, to do in practice. We have ideas for, using sort of bath engineering techniques or quantum feedback techniques to sort of stabilize those trajectories to get uh, what we expect out of the system. Uh, and that's something we're, we're thinking about but have not yet implemented. Got it. Um, 
There's a question from Vibe of Sharma. Are psi plus and psi minus orthogonal? If not, when you talk about tracking from psi plus to psi minus, do we really mean that there's some projection in both of them? So um, in our, for the experiment that we've done, we start and end in a place where they are quite orthogonal. So they're not exactly orthogonal, but they're quite orthogonal. And so the effect of projection from one or the other is less significant. Of course, as we go closer to the, the um, exceptional point, this, the eigenstates become less and less orthogonal. And so then one um, has to worry about which state one's interfering with. But I still think that we can, in, we rotate the state that we want to interfere into the reference state and that picks up the relevant phase for that state. But we haven't extensively explored experiments where we're measuring the geometric phases uh, for different states where the, they're not particularly orthogonal. Got it. Um, another question from Shuya Sherry Zhang. How does the readout fidelity of each of the different levels influence the measurement? One might naturally imagine that higher levels have lower readout fidelity. Yeah, indeed, the, so the most critical readout fidelity is that we don't, so after long experiments, we end up with a tremendous amount of population in the ground state. Perhaps we're evolving for 10 lifetimes of the qubit, almost all of the populations in that ground state. And so it's really critical that we isolate um, that state from these other states so we can perform accurate tomography. The trick that we use to do that is we actually uh, primarily make our readout on this F state here. It's a relatively stable state, so it doesn't decay very quickly. And we can play tricks where we'll say, rotate what's in the E state up to F or vice versa and allow population to clear out of these levels to make the fidelity of those measurements uh, quite high. I don't know specifically how high it is, but I think we can make the, the sort of wrong answer fidelity, the, the chance that we don't get the sort of contamination of this ground state becomes very, very small. Um, a sort of related question from Arian Jad Babai. Um, in this kind of three level system geometry, does ignoring the ground state change from an experimental perspective, the properties or what one has to do on now your effective two level system? Yeah, so thanks. Ariane, for the question, here's, here's the way to think about what's happening from this renormalization by just selecting, um, by ignoring the ground state population. A Hamiltonian is something like minus i gamma over two, zero, j, and j. And that in itself is not PT symmetric, but I can write that as minus i gamma over four times the identity um, plus minus i gamma over four plus i gamma over four J, J. And what that gives me is there's two pieces. One is this sort of an overall loss. And when, by throwing away the ground state probability of this post selection allows us to effectively ignore this term. It naturally renormalizes our density matrix by just looking at cases that, are, that evolve according to this effective PT symmetric Hamiltonian. And so, really, what it does is it amplifies the physics we want to see and allows us to ignore the sort of lossy physics that's not of interest to us. Um, one, another a question from Adam Kaufman. For the quantum diffusion process, when one measures a particular homodyne amplitude, what precisely is the state that the two-level system is projected into? Can you just read that one more time? I yeah, have yeah. To make sure For the I'm quantum sorry. diffusion process, when yeah. one measures a particular homodyne amplitude, what precisely is the state that the two-level system becomes projected into? Right, so let's, um, for me, it's best to visualize this on the block sphere. So let's say the initial state is the excited state, which I'll put at the top for convenience. Now, the, there's a map between the signal we detect and what the final state is. So each signal here is associated with a measurement uh, Krauss operator that maps this state onto the new state. So a positive signal uh, like that is gonna to correspond to mapping the state 
to some value here in the case of perfect efficiency. And maybe in the case of finite efficiency, it'll be something in inside the block sphere. So there's a one-to-one -one map between each signal and each, um, each final state of the, 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 the qubit after detecting that signal. And so the, the process of a quantum trajectory is just to go through and you know, count for each of the signals. And that gives you, here's this, allows you to connect the dots between the different states. Maybe, maybe we'll have one last question from John Simon. Um, he's interested in the connection between sort of many body physics and ground states in these non-Hermitian settings. So he's wondering if one has a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian for a many body system of lots of interacting uh, qubits like this, can there be different types of ground states that emerge compared to Hermitian Hamiltonians? Can the many body ground state be different for a Hermitian Hamiltonian? That's an excellent question. I would expect Jonathan Simon to ask something like that. Um, I don't know, that's a wonderful, I, I would love if that was the case. That's something we haven't thought about. And, um, so let me know what you think. But I, I think that would be really cool, but I don't know the answer. I would also love the case that that was my question, but Norm, that, that's actually Norm's question that he just assigned to me for unknown reasons. <laughs> that's great, Norm, thanks. Um, but that's, you know, that uh, answering that question is something students and postdocs can do together with Cater in the post-VAMOS discussion. Um, Cater, let me just uh, share screen for one second. Thank you so yeah. much for a super engaging talk. Um, let me just remind everyone that... Uh, we have upcoming talks next week. In particular, we have the quantum science seminar uh, next Thursday. It'll be from Fabio Schiarino on quantum advantage using photonics. And next week's VAMO seminar will be Wolfgang Ketterly on the spin dynamics of ultra cold atoms and optical lattice. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. See you at the um, afterwards chat. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Bye, Kater.